Please give it up for Sarah Anthony. Nice to be here. Um, okay, so they asked me to be here because I'm a documentary film producer, and I kind of feel like the first thing I should do is clarify exactly what that means, because people are always asking me, what does a producer actually do? And in my mind, the job of a producer in any field is just to make sure that the project, whatever it is, gets finished and out into the world. So for a documentary, that means you start with an idea, and then you put together the roadmap to turn that idea into a film. And the roadmap is a schedule and a budget, and it's total guesswork. Like, it's educated guesswork, but it's guesswork. You have no idea what's really gonna happen when you start. So you're just saying, make a plan and then have faith and move forward. And they say, if you wanna make God laugh, make a plan. So I feel like we make all the gods laugh every day. Sometimes, like in the studio world, you have budgetary restrictions. So you're trying to make the puzzle fit within that box. And then other times you have a bit more free reign and you're creating the parameters yourself. But either way, you're just trying to execute the director's vision in the least amount of time and money possible. And there's this old Peter O'Toole film, The Stuntman. The producer always walks around going, time, money, time. And it's kind of feel like that's what we do. We just make a plan, hire the team to execute it, and then like bounce back and forth between a cost report and a calendar for the rest of the project, just like trying to make it make sense. The HBO series, The Defiant Ones, I actually budgeted and scheduled as a 90-minute film to be finished in one year. But as soon as we started doing the interviews, we realized that we had like, way too much material for one film, because we're basically telling like a version of the history of rock and roll in the history of West Coast hip-hop. So that's a lot of story. So three and a half years and four episodes later, HBO has a really good product, but like as a producer, you're just trying to ride the wave sometimes. The Greeks have two words for time. Kronos, which is the time when things are scheduled to happen, and Kairos, which is the time when things are supposed to happen. So if you're interviewing someone like, say, Snoop Dogg, and he shows up four and a half hours late, that's because that's when the interview was supposed to happen. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's what happened, but <laughs> if it did, it would be Kairos time. Um, and like, we'd all love to live in a Kairos world. Sometimes in film, you have no choice because it rains or your lead character dies. Literally anything could happen. And the job of a producer is just to try and marry Kronos and Kairos and get to the end of the project before the money runs out. And in the documentary world, you're dealing with real life, and real life is not an eight-hour day. So like, Dr. Dre is a night owl. So if you're working with him, you are also a night owl. And you'll probably end up drinking gin and juice during that night, <laughs> truly. Hendrix and cranberry, just so you know. Um, but the studio execs are not night owls, so welcome to your 21-hour workday. And if your character is, if you need to film them like celebrating Thanksgiving, you're not celebrating it with your own family. If their plans change, so do yours. So like my family learned a long time ago not to try and schedule anything too far in advance. And we have this like not so funny joke that we try and finish work in single digits on the left side of midnight. So like 9.56 p.m., yes, made it. <laughs> so it can be a little bit stressful. And especially because it's guesswork. Like, I have no idea how many days or weeks it's gonna take us to find a character we need. I'm just guessing. So it can really be very stressful. <laughs> and also in the documentary world, you have limited budgets and less revenue. So you don't make a lot of money. So why would anybody do this job? And I think that that's the key to everything, really, in life, is like, why? What do you wanna do? with your limited time on the planet? And why are you doing what you're doing? I happen to believe if your life has meaning outside of yourself, that you're gonna find more joy and less stress. But as a storyteller especially, I think it's important to know why. Like we focus a lot on how to do something, but if you focus on the why, the how is just kind of details. Like maybe you have limited resources, so you're better off doing a photo essay than a film 
or maybe your story lends itself more to a podcast or a magazine article. Like, how is less of a barrier when you know why you're telling the story and why you want to get it out in the world? I did not set out to be a documentary filmmaker. I studied theater in college. And it was like an acting class after college I got introduced to film. And I really liked the technical aspects of it and the collaborative nature of the business, because there's jobs for everybody in film, you know? Like musicians, actors, chefs, truck drivers, blue collar workers, creative designers, technicians. Like it's a really eclectic group of people working together toward a common goal, so it can be really fun. Also, my parents are very conservative, so theater was not a good choice. And <laughs> film was maybe a little better. So I started working as a production assistant on feature films. And my first thing I learned was check your ego at the door and be willing to work really hard. And the first project I worked on was Happy Texas. And I showed up on set the first day, and the line producer said, Sarah, come with me. I need you to sweep the street. And I was like, we were in this little desert town north of Los Angeles, and it was really windy. So there's sand blowing up all over the place. I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to be able to make a dent in this, but he's the boss. So I swept the street <laughs> twice. And I was like, OK, there's nothing I can do. I walked away. And like half an hour later, he came and found me. He's like, Sarah, come with me. Walked out to the street. He's like, you swept it. I said, yeah, I mean, I know it doesn't really look like it, but I did. And there's not a whole lot I can do. He's like, no, 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 don't apologize. You did a really good job. Now you're going to come with me while I fire the two people who didn't sweep the street when I asked them to. OK. <laughs> It was like a super intense introduction to a really intense business. And I worked for that man for the next two years, did a whole bunch of films back to back to back. And I learned, well, one of the things that kind of drove me crazy is that everybody gets really stressed out. They take film really seriously. And I always thought, like, it's supposed to be fun. We're making movies. But people get mean. I don't know if you've seen Swimming with Sharks, but yeah. And if you haven't, you should. People get mean. And after a while, I just got kind of burnt out. Like, we had this one period where we worked four months in a row, no days off. I finally got a Sunday off. I went to the beach, and this was like before cell phones, so I had a pager, and they paged me to go into the office, and I threw my pager into the ocean. <laughs> I was like, I'm not doing it. And then I was like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> and I ran and found a payphone, and I was like, I'm coming in. I just have to get my pager fixed, because <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> So I was super burnt out. And I realize now that that's because I was following someone else's why. Like the guy that I was working for, he just wanted to be in what he called the picture business. He like wanted to be the head of a studio one day. So he didn't care. He just loved working in film. He didn't even really care what products we were working on. He just wanted to be in film and move up in it. And one day, so I was just paying my rent. I had no why. And one day, somebody was like, you need a job? I said, yeah. I showed up on set, and it was like a softcore porn version of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Seriously, like, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future were these scantily clad women that like floated in <laughs> through the window in billowy lingerie. <laughs> like, I get there the first day. And oh, I went forward too fast, sorry. I get there the first day. This is broken. <laughs> and, and, uh, the actress and the director are arguing about what's her motivation and like how scantily clad can she be in this particular scene. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> like, I just didn't know my why. And Los Angeles in particular can be a really difficult place to navigate if you don't know your why, because there's a super fine line between ambition and desperation. And if you don't have your own center, you can get really caught up in other people like fighting for some vague notion of fame and success. So sometimes in life, you just have to like stop, reset, and go, OK, what am I doing with my time on the planet? And I was really lucky. I had dual citizenship. So I did a total reset, moved to London. But wherever you go, you take yourself with you. So the only thing on my resume was film production. I just started sending it out to any company that I like the name of. I sent it to a place called Envision, because I like the word Envision. 
And that's when I learned that you should put everything you even remotely know how to do on your resume because you don't know what's going to get you through the door. And they called me in for an interview because I listed FileMaker Pro as one of my skills. I think I used the program like twice. But nobody in England ever used it. And they were working with an American company, so I got in the door. And once you're in the door, you can be honest about limited experience and you can learn anything. And once you're in the door, don't let it close. <laughs> so the director of the company was like, you do know we do documentaries, right? Because I only had features on my resume. I was like, oh, yeah, of course. I've always wanted to do documentaries. <laughs> I never even thought about it before. But it seemed like it would be fun. And it is because like, every film is a master class in a new subject. And we did the author P.G. Woodhouse, um, Ming Voyages of the 1400s, the extremes that you go to to get oil geographically, environmentally, politically. We did a film with Robin McNeil about the different accents around America. And that made my parents really happy because my dad loved watching the McNeil Lehrer News Hour. So it was like, oh, maybe film's not such a bad choice for you. And then the last project we did was The Age of AIDS for Frontline. And it was a four-hour series on the history of the AIDS pandemic. And it was really depressing. Because like everywhere we went in the world for almost four years was the worst place you could go in the world. And we just saw the worst of humanity, you know, like bigotry, recklessness, greed, intolerance, hatred, all just wrapped up in this nasty ball. By the end of that project, I was so depressed. I did not know what to do with myself. I knew I wanted to do something to like, make the world a better place, but so vague. I didn't know how or what. So I did another reset. And I went traveling, and in New Zealand, I saw an inconvenient truth. You know that Al Gore documentary about climate change? It had just come out, and at the end of that film, they give you like really clear, small things, but really clear things you can do to help. And I thought, wow, that's cool. A film that like, sparks a conversation and then gives you something you can actually do. That would be cool. And I went through Southeast Asia, and somebody gave me a book along the way about child slavery and sex trafficking, like lighthearted vacation reading. <laughs> and <laughs> by the time I got to Delhi, I was walking around looking at these buildings thinking, oh my god. I know there are kids working in there. And the most popular prostitutes are three to 11-year-old girls. So I just wanted to like bust into every factory, every brothel, and just rescue them one by one, like take them out. But that just did not seem practical or possible for a little white girl. So, and also it just didn't seem like big enough. You know, I wanted to do something more than just one at a time. So I was walking around the slum one day and there were these people huddled around a battered old television. And I remembered that like in Klong Toy, the worst slums in Bangkok, or the favelas in Brazil, people, no matter how poor they are, they always seem to be able to access a television. And I went back to the hostel that night and there was a Hallmark movie playing. I was like, Ugh. if I can watch a Hallmark movie in the back alleys of Delhi, then film really does have the most potential as a medium to reach the most amount of people. So I thought, okay. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna move back to Los Angeles, and get inside the belly of the beast, figure out how to be a Hollywood producer, and use the power of Hollywood to make a movie about child slaves that will change the global conversation, or maybe start one about child slavery. But I didn't know exactly how to do that, so I decided to apply to the Peter Stark Producing Program to learn how to be a producer. And while I was waiting to see if I got in, I was temping at the LA Regional Food Bank and I was doing data entry in this little tiny office next to a warehouse full of rotting food. I was bored and it smelled. But when you know your like, big picture why, that kind of stuff doesn't really matter as much. And then as it turns out, the how usually works out differently than you think it will. I got an email from a friend of a friend in London. She knew somebody who was starting a documentary division in Los Angeles and I sent my resume in. They happened to be working with Frontline. So they hired me to run their documentary division. So I went from being at the food bank one day to running a documentary company in Beverly Hills the next day, because life is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they had just done 
Bob Dylan's No Direction Home. So they were really in demand in the music documentary world. Oh, it is working. I just can't tell the difference here. OK, sorry. Um, so it wasn't child slavery, right? That's about as far as you can get from child slavery. But I realized that what I really want to do is make films that inspire change. And if you're making films about people who are at the top of their game, whatever industry it's in, you can always learn something cool from them. Like Jimmy Iovine in The Defiant Ones when he talks about fear being a tailwind instead of a headwind. I really like that. And in the um, Scorsese doc, the George Harrison doc, there's an interview with George where he says, people say I'm the Beatle who changed the most, but I think that's what life is about. If you haven't changed, if you're not changing and growing, what are you doing? I really like that. That's about 10 years ago. And since then, I've done a lot of different films for a lot of different companies. And one thing I really picked up along the way is that when you know your why, even if you're doing something that doesn't seem related to it, you should share it with everyone you meet. Because you have no idea who's going to be a partner in your future success. Like, a couple weeks after I got back to LA, I met a girl at a party. We talked about documentaries and child slavery. I gave her my card. I don't hear from her, I don't know, for like three years. And then three years later, I get a call from her brother. And he's making a documentary about Sly and the Family Stone. And I ended up being a producer on it, and it's still one of my favorite films. And when I left Spitfire, I interviewed a guy to take over my job. And we talked about why we're doing what we're doing. He didn't end up taking the job. But two years later, he recommended me as the line producer for The World According to Dick Cheney which also made my father very happy. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with the man's politics, but I learned a lot on that project. One of the big things is everybody we interviewed said that he has an incredible work ethic and that he was always the most prepared person in the room. And if you're the most prepared person in the room, you're going to win the argument, usually. So I think that's a lesson that everybody could take and maybe use it for good. Uh, <laughs> At the end of that project, the editor and director recommended me to Davis Guggenheim. And he was the director of An Inconvenient Truth. And when I watched that movie, I didn't even know who Davis was. I never in a million years imagined that I'd end up working with him. We've done two projects so far, the DREAM Act and immigration reform, called The Dream Is Now, and one about the broken financial system. And it's really cool to work with people who have the same why as you. It makes being in Los Angeles a little easier this time around. <laughs> so cut to two years ago. I'm working on The Defiant Ones. And that really, a film about hip hop billionaires, is as far as you can get from child slavery. It's just a completely different universe. But I thought. Maybe it would help my career, and it would be fun. <laughs> and I guess that's why I'm on this stage, so it does help. But um, <laughs> it, I thought, you know, if I did enough films like that, that maybe somebody would go, OK, we're going to give you money to make a film you want to make. As it happens, again, the how is different. I was driving home from work one day, and I get a phone call from somebody in Davis's office asking me if I want to make a documentary about a guy in Delhi who breaks into factories and brothels and rescues child slaves. <laughs> so <laughs> I like, pulled the car over <laughs> and had to like, stop for a second. I was like, this is not how I thought this would happen. But the how really doesn't matter. And now, like when I'm in India and I'm dealing with things like the language barriers, I don't know. So, <laughs> this is an example of adapting as a producer. I had no idea there are over 100 different languages in India, and that every 10 kilometers in the rural areas, the dialect changes, like every 10 to 20 kilometers. So this is me on the day when we had to drive 80 kilometers, and I got pushed into the back of the van because we had to pick up a new person like every 10 kilometers. And we had about six different people in there because just trying to communicate and get to the next place. We spent so far six times what I budgeted for translations and subtitles. <laughs> uh, this is the day after the government canceled the currency overnight, and our cash became useless. 
and we didn't have credit card. Well, we had credit cards, but we couldn't use them because there was no electricity, so we couldn't put gas in the car. So I'm carrying the tripod as we walk between villages. I could not have planned for that. <laughs> but when you're dealing with stuff like that, or monsoons, or bed bugs, or food poisoning, no matter how stressed out you can get, if you know your big picture why, you can reset really fast and like stay in joy a lot more because it doesn't matter. So my takeaways <laughs> are be flexible. Check your ego at the door. I forget my own takeaways. Oh, put everything you ever wanted to do or knew how to do on your resume. <laughs> Make everyone you meet a potential partner in your success and find your why. <laughs> and I told somebody a couple of days ago that I was doing this speech and I said I'm going to talk about find your why and he's like, you do know that Simon Sinek wrote a best-selling novel <laughs> called Find Your Why? I was like, no, <laughs> I've never heard of it. <laughs> Maybe I've been buried in an edit suite, I don't know. So I decided I would modify it to share your why. <laughs> Because um, you just never know. And that line producer that I swept the street for 20 years ago, he's now the head of a division at a major studio. He's probably going to be the head of the studio one day. And now I appreciate his why. Like, he just wants to entertain people. And I think there's altruism inherent in entertainment. Because if you're being entertained, you're not fighting. If you're being uplifted, you're not tearing the world around you apart. So I appreciate his why now. And a couple weeks ago he called and he offered us a free screening room for the film, a really good deal on sound design, and he's going to help with promotion of the project because he believes that we could change the global conversation on child slavery. So I have no idea what's going to happen with that project, but I'm really glad I swept the street.